Hey everyone, Mr. Fransky here. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, composition using inverse trig functions. So we talked about the inverse trig functions the other day, right? Sine and tangent use just the right side of the circle, so sine inverse and tan inverse. And then uh, cosine inverse, remember, uses just the top half of the circle. And uh, today we're going to talk about composing some of these functions together and how you just have to be careful with your answers. I'm also going to give you a pretty cool challenge problem that's a real-life application of uh, inverse trig functions, which is kind of cool. So let's jump in here. Uh, so we're going to start with some bell work, just a few problems from last time. So if you want to pause the video here and see if you can figure out these values, feel free to do so. All right, let's take a look at them together. So sine inverse of root 3 over 2. Remember this here, I'm asking myself, where is sine root 3 over 2, and it has to happen on the right side of the circle, right? It can only happen on the right side of the circle. Root 3 over 2 is a pretty easy one. That's just pi over 6, right? Or pi over 3, excuse me. Okay. Cosine inverse of negative root 2 over 2. So cosine uses the top half of the circle. Negative root 2 over 2, that's going to be on the left side here. So that must be 3 pi over 4. There we go. Arc sine of negative 1 half, that's going to use the right side of the circle again, negative 1 half right here, that happens at negative pi over 6. Now remember you cannot use 11 pi over 6, right, because that would go through the wall here. You definitely can't use 7 pi over 6, right, because even though it's sine is negative 1 half there, that's in no man's land, right? Okay, tan inverse of root 3, so using the right side of the circle, root 3 happens up here at pi over 3 as well. Arc cosine of 0. So where is cosine 0 on the top half of the circle? Remember, cosine is the x-coordinate, so we've got to be on the y-axis. That so must be up here at pi over 2. And then arc tan of negative 1. So that's tangent inverse of negative 1. Tangent is negative 1 at the 45 right here on the right side of the circle. So that's going to be at negative pi over 4. Awesome. All right, so let's talk about some composition stuff. So back when we learned this in like chapter one or chapter two, we talked about inverse functions. The whole idea is that inverse functions undo each other. So inverses, whoops, come on, undo each other. Okay, and that's just fine, right? Because the whole idea like if f of x is, let's say, x cubed, so remember the way we found the inverse root y equals x cubed, we switched x and y, so x equals y cubed, and we solve for y, right? y is a cube root of x. And the whole idea of ab, so this would be f inverse, right? f inverse of x would be the cube root of x. So the whole idea of these is that if you plug them into each other, so if you do f of f inverse of x, or f inverse of f of x, the whole idea was that they both spit back out x, right? They should both give you back out x. And in this case, they do. Cube root of x cubed is indeed x, and the cube root of x quantity cubed is also equal to x. That works out. The problem with, um, man, this is being messy today. The problem with this is that uh, with sine, cosine, and tangent inverse, because we have these restricted domains, this isn't necessarily always going to be true. So let's take a look at some of these problems. So the question is, does it work for trig? So just remember to work inside out here. That's the main thing, is just work inside out. And you learned this back when you first learned function notation. Do the inside function first. So this is going to be cosine inverse of cosine of pi over 3. Pi over 3 is right here. That is uh, 1 half. So it's cosine inverse of 1 half, which is indeed pi over 3, right? Because now we have to think we only use the top half of the circle. That is pi over 3. So it works on that one, right? Let's take a look at the next one. So the next one is cosine inverse of cosine of 5 pi over 4. So if we do 5 pi over 4, 1, 3, 5, that's down in the third quadrant here. Cosine there is negative root 2 over 2. So we have cosine inverse of negative root 2 over 2. Well, now the problem is I have to give an answer on the top half of the circle. This is not on the top half of the circle. So my answer now is going to be right here at 3 pi over 4. So again, just work inside out, right? Don't, don't just assume that you can just pop back out the value, because sometimes it clearly works, but there are lots of times where it's not going to. Let's take a look at one more. Inverse cosine of cosine of negative pi over 6. So negative pi over 6 is right here. Cosine there is root 3 over 2. Inverse cosine of root 3 over 2, that's going to be on the top, that's positive pi over 6. So I wouldn't memorize any tricks for that, like it's like, oh, it was negative, now it's positive. Don't do it, don't do anything like that. Just work inside out, right? Find the value, then do the inverse cosine of it. I got one more here in the moral of the story. So um, sine inverse of cosine of pi. So we have sine inverse of cosine of pi, that's on the left side, that's negative 1. So sine is negative 1, down at the bottom here, that's negative pi over 2. So again, the moral of the story, just work on the, from the inside out, okay? So just make sure that you're checking your domain. Okay, so check domain and range. Just make sure that you're getting things in the right spot of the circle where they have to be. 
Okay, you should be able to do the packet now. Um, some of them are a little bit different than problems we've seen with the inverse. Uh, like the first page of the packet is like sine x equals one half, and they say give all the answers from zero to two pi. So in that case, they're not asking you to use sine inverse, right? They're actually asking when sine is one half. That happens at pi over six and five pi over six, right? So don't worry about the inverses on those, but if they do ask an inverse question, make sure you're using the right side or top side of the circle, whichever uh, part is necessary. And now I want to do a challenge problem. So this is a challenge problem that has to do with inverse trig. It's a pretty cool one. Um, I like it a lot, and it allows you to use a calculator. You have to have a graphing calculator to be able to solve this problem. In calculus, you can do this without a calculator, uh, but we don't know the techniques to be able to do that yet. So let's take a look at it. So you're at the movies in Sydney, Australia, at the largest movie screen in the world. I looked this up. Um, this is supposedly the largest continuous movie screen in the world. Um, if the bottom of the screen is five feet off the ground, how far back should you sit to maximize your viewing angle of the screen? Let's kind of draw a picture of this. So we have a 96 foot tall movie screen, and it's five feet off the ground. Clearly not to scale, <laughs> right? Okay, so the question is, right, if you're sitting like right here, okay, if you're sitting in your chair right here, the viewing angle is going to be terrible, right? It's going to be way small. If you're sitting too far back, though, you're not going to be able to see anything. Okay, because the viewing angle, once again, is going to be pretty small. There is some optimal place to sit here where your viewing angle of the screen, theta right here, is going to be the largest possible, right? It starts super small, then it gains, get bigger, and then it's going to get small again as you move out. Let's get rid of all this mess and kind of show what the problem's asking. So the question is, if you are here, right, so it's five feet off the ground, so it's the viewing angle of the screen goes just on the screen here. So where should you sit in order to maximize that theta value? So you're trying to maximize theta. So you're going to have to figure out, right, so this x value right here. So how far away should you sit? And what you're going to have to do is get some kind of a function that involves theta and x, and then you'll have to graph it and find, hopefully it makes some kind of a shape like this, you'll have to find that maximum point and figure out how far back you should be. So you're going to have x on the x-axis and theta here. So you have to have some function that relates theta and x to be able to figure that out. I'll give you one hint. You're going to have to add some more variables in here, right? So there might be some other values on this triangle that you might need to use in order to figure this out. And you might be able to do this better after you do uh, some of the problems on the next packet you're going to get about right triangle trig, um, just because it's going to make you think outside the box a little bit more. But this is a cool problem. Uh, if you write up a nice solution of it and give it to me, I'll find some bonus points for you. Um, but it's an interesting problem, and it's good to just kind of think on and just ask questions about, um, and I think that you'll enjoy it. So I believe that's all I've got for you. I love you guys. That's why I'm here. Uh, good luck on those packets, and have a great day.